Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk 2021 season. If you have any questions during this presentation today, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, 21 editions of crop talk as we uh, get into a growing season and and look at what's going to happen this coming year. Um, right now, it looks like uh, we're in for another interesting year. Uh, by the way, starting so far, anyways, uh, whether you look at uh, uh, crop uh, prices, uh, fertilizer prices, uh, and uh, and weather, I think there's a, a lot of things right now that uh, are are popping up that are making producers ask questions and industry people ask questions and uh, and so uh, I hope that uh, we'll have a, an interesting year. Uh, for today's uh, webinar uh, we're going to start off with uh, a weather update and, and look at things to come and uh, Allison Sass is going to be uh, presenting there uh, and then we're going to go to our uh, crop scouting panel. We uh, decided to continue with that again this year. Uh, we had uh, Fairly good response with it last year with with questions coming in, so uh, we're going to continue on with that as well. So with that, uh, let's get started. And Allison Sass uh, is going to give us a little bit of a weather update. So uh, transfer the screen, Laurie. Okay, Allison, it looks great. Awesome, thank you. Um, well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning. My name is Allison Sass, and I'm the Ag Meteorology Specialist with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. And I've been with the program for a year today, so it's my work anniversary today. And uh, what better way to celebrate than giving a, a weather update? Um, so today I'll be talking about what we saw last summer, uh, a summary of some of the conditions that we uh, saw during the last growing season, what we saw over the fall and what we're currently seeing, and what we could maybe see um, showing uh, in the forecast to come. So I'll start with a, a brief introduction to the fall conditions um, and what we saw last uh, season going into the fall, and then I'll cover the winter and current conditions. Uh, followed by the growing season outlook and then some updates on what we're doing with the weather program. So conditions moving into the fall. Um, I have here two maps showing the total accumulation of precipitation for the whole growing season last year from May 1st to September 30th, as well as the percent of a normal accumulated precipitation. So last year, as a summary, we saw that precipitation for the growing season was very variable across the province. It really depended where you were. And much of this province saw below normal precipitation. Uh, so percent normal precipitation is the total accumulated precipitation compared to a 30 year average. And the averages that we use currently are, I believe from 1970 to 2000. Uh, the exceptions to this were in the west near Riding Mountain National Park and in the southeast near Gardenton, um, where they had higher than normal precipitation um, observed. And those were mostly due to a few isolated extreme rain events that we saw in both those areas. May seemed to be a dry period um, for the majority of Agra Manitoba last year. Um, Gladstone, for example, received just 9% of its historical average that month. However, in July, we saw more than half of our weather stations seeing above average rainfall. In August, several areas of the southeast, central, and interlake regions had less than 60% of the historical average of precipitation. So again, in summary, um, overall, most areas had below normal precipitation, but the precipitation that we did receive seemed to be uh, very timely uh, receiving it in July. 
here's an example of the um, differences between years that we saw at a given station. So I used uh, Treehern, Manitoba as an example. And you can see that um, for last year, for 2020, the entire growing season was below normal um, precipitation. However, it was very close to normal in July, which may have contributed to some uh, crop success. You can see that in the past few years, with the exception of 2019, have been drier than normal. And this is contributing to some concerns that we're seeing uh, across Agro Manitoba that um, this may be a cumulative effect and we're seeing dry conditions upon dry conditions. Uh, a unique thing about last year was the wind. So we saw a, that wind was a significant player throughout the 2020 growing season. Um, and that's not something that we usually talk about a lot in weather, but it seemed to have a really significant effect last year. Um, it impacted seeding, it impacted harvest, um, there was soil movement, um, and it really caused some issues around the province. We found that daily wind, uh, that mean daily wind speeds were approximately 1.3 kilometers per hour, higher than the previous daily mean in 2019. On average, the maximum wind speeds during the 2020 growing season exceeded the previous high by three kilometers per hour, and maximum wind speeds of over 90 kilometers per hour were reported at over 29 stations this year, or last year, I should say. On June 17th, the maximum wind speed exceeded 90 kilometers per hour at 12 of our weather stations. We're not sure if this trend is going to continue, um, in recent months, we have seen some windy conditions already, so we're going to continue to monitor um, what happens this growing season to see if this is a trend that's, um, that's going to be happening and, and possibly cause some concern this year. This is a regional representation of the soil moisture conditions at the fall of 2020 before the soil froze. Uh, and this is from the zero to 30 centimeter depth. This gives an indication of how much water is available. Um, that, so the percent of available water holding capacity is the uh, maximum amount of water that the soil can hold. And we do this in the fall because the plant, and there's nothing taking up um, the water during the winter as it's frozen. Um, so the regions in yellow, orange, and red show lower than normal precipitation, lower than normal percent moist soil moisture. And you'll notice that there is a, a great variation in soil moisture values. Keep in mind um, that these soil moisture values are a snapshot in time. So it is the soil moisture on this day at this site. And th soil characteristics such as texture, organic matter, and bulk density will greatly increase, will greatly impact the available water held by the soil. And this can vary greatly over very short distances. For this map, we do estimate the soil properties based on their soil characteristics. We have not created any soil moisture maps for this growing season yet. Um, because we like to wait for the soil temperatures to rise above zero consistently to ensure that our soil moisture readings are accurate. Um, so we're hoping we'll probably be launching those a little earlier this year. So we usually launch them um, in mid-May, but I'm thinking um, depending on how temperatures uh, cooperate or not cooperate, over the next few weeks, I can see us uh, maybe even starting those soil ma moisture maps by the end of April. Uh, each year we like to create a map of weather extremes to highlight some of the extreme conditions that we saw uh, for the entire year um, of the previous year. So this is the map from the weather extremes of 2020 and just some highlights and points of interest 
we had the greatest number of days with wind above 50 kilometers per hour at Snowflake, and it had 137 days where wind speed was measured at over 50 kilometers per hour at some point in the day. Also keeping with that wind trend, the highest wind gusts that we saw all year was on June 30th at Clearwater, which reported a wind speed of 125 kilometers per hour. As we were talking about uh, low precipitation values, the longest stretch without measurable precipitation was observed at Elm Creek, who experienced 28 days with uh, out measurable precipitation. The lowest annual precipitation was observed at Minto with only 204 millimeters of precipitation. And the greatest amount of precipitation was observed at Sprague Lake with 516 millimeters. So now I'll move on to some of the current conditions and what we saw during the winter. Now, I created the majority of this presentation um, on Monday and Tuesday, so I had to make some updates today. And I thought this picture wasn't really representative of what we're seeing currently. So I replaced it with a picture from yesterday in my backyard that does show what we're experiencing here in Winnipeg. So these precipitation maps uh, show the precipitation received since November 1st, 2020, and up to April 11th. The total precipitation is highest in the Northwest and East, and most of this is contributed to some heavy, heavy snowfall events that we saw in the Northwest and some recent rain events in the East. However, overall, the percentage of normal precipitation is well below average in most regions of Agro Manitoba. Only the PAW has received higher than normal, higher than normal precipitation. All other stations have reported lower than 80% of normal of the 30-year average. So we were relieved to see some snow in many parts. So for the winter temperatures, um, we track the mean temperature difference from normal. So this shows uh, how the mean temperatures that we're observing vary from the 30-year an average of temperatures throughout the winter. So this figure shows the mean temperature difference from November 1st to April 11th. And all of our stations in our network showed mean temperature differences above normal for the majority of the off season. Most of Agro Manitoba had temperature differences between two and four degrees Celsius above the 30 year average. This compared to last year, where we saw that temperatures were on average 0 0.5 to 1.5 degrees above normal on average, with the exception of the Northwest. So last year we saw a lot more variation in um, the temperatures, although we did see that the majority were still above normal. However, this year, the temperatures have been normal, uh, above normal through the majority of the uh, winter. Moving on to soil temperature. So these are some recent soil temperatures from a few locations ac across the province. So we have the top graph is a few stations in the central region, followed by a few stations in the eastern region. Then we have the interlake, the northwest, and the final graph is of the southwest. So you can see that we are seeing uh, temperatures warming across Agro Manitoba, and most of them have, there's a range from um, high temperatures of anywhere between six degrees and eight degrees Celsius. However, you can see that um, around April 12th, most of the soil temperatures have approached zero as we've seen cooler air temperatures and the addition of that snow. Uh, I did a quick check this morning on soil temperatures as well, and pretty much all the stations, again, are hovering um, just above zero right now. 
So while it is promising that we see warmer soil temperatures, we still have to keep in mind that there is a risk of frost. And uh, for example, last year, our last spring frost was on May 20th in the east in the interlake. So you always want to lose, use caution. So speaking of frost, uh, here's the average date of the last spring frost based on historic interpolated data from 1961 to 1912. This shows the 50% risk, meaning that you can expect the last spring frost to be later than the given range, one out of two years. You can see that generally further north you are, the later date of the last spring frost. This is the 10% risk date of the last spring frost based on the same data. This map shows the probability that the last spring frost will be later than the given range, one in 10 years. And finally, the 25% risk map, which shows the probability of the last spring frost would be later than the values given is one out of four years. So the latest frost in this figure, for example, uh, would be between June 4th and June 7th. And there's a, a one in four um, probability that that would occur. So um, as we know, weather is changing all the time. And so I ran a quick update uh, since those precipitation maps I showed earlier were only up until April 11th. Um, we can see that, that things change in a day or two. So this is the three-day accumulated precipitation. So the amount of precipitation that we received, the water equivalent, I should say, between April 11th and April 13th with this recent snowfall. The eight sites that received the most precipitation are shown in the table to the right. The greatest snowfall was received in the east and parts of the interlake. The lowest values we observed were in Brunkild with only 0.4 millimeters. Holland had 0.7 millimeters. Minidosa recorded 0.8 millimeters, and Kola recorded one millimeter. So again, a very variable um, winter event um, where we saw a lot of uh, varying snowfall amounts. The snow has not changed the overall percentage of normal precipitation for the entire off season, however. Although we are seeing more stations in the east with a percent normal precipitation above 50%. So, although we did get some moisture, the overall impact to the normal precipitation was not that significant. Um, but again, it was very useful to have precipitation of any kind in, in many parts. And I will be running a total accumulated precipitation map uh, later today. and hopefully we'll post these um, later on on our website. So the growing season forecast. Um, I'll start with kind of a, a comparison of what was predicted last year um, versus what we received or what we observed. So last year, um, spring temperatures had a 40 to 60% probability that the temperatures in Agro Manitoba would be below normal for April to June, based on the Environment Canada uh, predictions. Looking at the map that I created for the same period using last year's data, this is similar to what we observed. Much of Agro Manitoba experienced mean temperatures slightly below normal from April to June with May being cooler than normal and temperatures increasing through June and July. This year, Environment Canada, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada is predicting a 40 to 50 percent probability that spring will be warmer than normal in southern Agro Manitoba from May, June to July. There's a 40 to 50 percent 
probability that northern Agro Manitoba will see temperatures below normal this spring. This does not mean that the temperatures will be higher than normal or cooler in the north every day. It simply means that there's a 40 to 50 percent expectation that on average April to June will be warmer than average. So far in April, this is what we have seen. Again, it's early in April, but we have seen uh, slightly warmer than normal temperatures uh, in the south. The July, August to September forecast shows a 40% probability that Agro Manitoba will experience temperatures above normal based on the 1981 to 2010 normals. Please keep in mind that these are long-term forecasts and should be taken with a grain of salt. They are not determining what the temperatures will be. They're simply showing, based on a variety of models, the probability that temperatures might be above or below or near normal. So last year's predictions for precipitation they were expected to have the same probability that precipitation would be either above or below normal in the Northwest. Well, with the Northwest having 40% probability of precipitation being above normal. So on these maps, when you see no colors in an area, it basically means that there's the same percentage expectation that it will be above or below uh, normal. What we saw last year was below normal precipitation throughout most of the province uh, from April to June. The Northwest had regions that received near normal or slightly above normal precipitation by June, as did the East. This trend continued throughout the season with much of the province having lower than normal precipitation. So what to expect in terms of pre precipitation this year? There is equal probability that Agro Manitoba will receive more or less than normal precipitation. This means that there is not more than a 40% expectation that precipitation will be above or below or normal. So you can see that the entire province of Manitoba is not colored. So basically this means that precipitation is extremely difficult to predict and localized systems often develop which are difficult to predict in the long term. While it is difficult to predict what precipitation will occur in the long term, the normal precipitation isn't the most important aspect of the forecast. It's when that precipitation will be received. So in the predictions for July, August, and September, you can see again that it is expected that there's equal probability that we'll get below normal precipitation as there is that we'll get above normal precipitation and it's the same expectation that we'll get near normal precipitation. So again it's not the normals that necessarily determine the success of a growing season. For example last year while we saw below normal precipitation in many parts overall the, precip the precipitation that was received in many areas was timely in July, for example, and contributed to good yields. However, an example such as 2019, when some stations received much higher than normal precipitation in September, it was far too late to be useful for crops and actually created a lot of problems with harvest. So a few updates um, with our Manitoba Agriculture Weather Program. Uh, we currently have 111 professional grade weather stations across Agro Manitoba. We added two stations last year, one in Stead and one in Riverton. Each station measures temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, wind direction, pressure, precipitation, solar radiation, and all of our stations now measure soil moisture and soil temperature. 15 minute intervals are reported live on our website during the growing season and they're updated hourly during the winter. And all of the data, the live data, is publicly available on our website at our current weather viewer. 
So this is an image from our current weather viewer. Again, it's available to access and it updates uh, either hourly during the winter up until May 1st or every 15 minutes. And it shows the location of all of our weather stations as well as the live conditions. So you can choose which conditions you're viewing based on selecting any of the tabs at the top of the page. So here in this image, we have wind speed showing and wind direction. If you want further information on a given station, you simply have to click on one of the icon station icons, or in this case, it would be one of the arrows. And it'll provide you a live detailed look at the uh, conditions at that given station, as well as a summary of yesterday's conditions. We also provide historical data uh, on our website. However, not all of our stations are available at this time, um, but we are happy to provide historical data on request. We also create seasonal reports and maps for the public, and we post these on our website at uh, weather conditions and reports or you can also subscribe to our mailing list and have them emailed to you weekly. So we create, during the growing season, we create uh, heat unit maps, including corn heat units, growing degree days, and P days, as well as soil moisture maps and precipitation maps, as well as a detailed crop weather report, which gives you the individual values for each station. We also create special maps in the case of a special weather event or a severe event, including severe rainfall, frost, or major wind events. During the off season, we still create maps. Um, we do the, just the precipitation and temperature maps for the off season. So our current activities is we're hoping to install up to 12 new stations this season. So we're looking for a variety of locations um, in the Northwest, as well as filling in some gaps in the central region around Miami and Oakville. Um, we're also going to be upgrading our solar panels this year. So in the, all of our stations are solar powered. And we found this past winter with some of those very long, very cold snaps that we had. It really put a strain on some of our weather stations. So we're hoping that upgrading to larger solar panels will help to resolve that issue. We're also always working with partners on um, some models as well. So Tim Yojo is our agricultural meteorology modeler, and he's working on some fusarium head blight projects as well as potato head blight. And we want to remind you that there's other applications for our weather network as well. So um we have partners that use the information for flood and drought forecasting um, pesticide efficacy and application uh, fire prediction research um, wind monitoring there's a whole variety of applications for our weather network um, of course agriculture being the main one um, but it's nice to to really expand our our partnerships um, through other departments and through research. So with that, I will close and thank you very much for your attention this morning and joining us. Again, if you have any questions or data requests, you can contact me uh, by email. And I'd also like to thank the other members of our AgNet team, Kevin, Adam, Timmy, and Brian. Okay, thanks, Allison. Uh, there, uh, there is a couple questions for you. Uh, I guess um, you had talked about the wind, and uh, has there been any uh, talk as to why we're seeing increasing winds, and is it similar across the prairies? Uh, I haven't done too much investigation on that yet. Um, I know that in our graph here, I'll just zoom back. I'm not sure if I, I haven't done any looking into whether it's a, a prairie wide um, issue or not. Um, 
and I'm not sure if it's going to be an issue going forward, but it's definitely something that we're going to be looking into, and that's definitely something that I want to look into now as well. So I will take a note of that and cross the prairies. And because okay. it would be really interesting to see that. Yeah, it would. Um, also, um, uh, you had talked about uh, the snow and you converted it into millimeters of rain. So is there an actual conversion then of snow in millimeters to rain or precipitation? Um, our instruments measure it in uh, water. So our instrument, the snow falls into our rain, our precipitation gauge and then it's melted right away to get that um, to get that reading so we actually measure it in millimeters um, I have seen that there is some discussion like snow varies if you measure how deep snow is it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a usually the ratio that's used is 10 to 1 I believe so for every 10 um centimeters of snow i believe it's one millimeter of water i could be wrong again i'm just thinking off the top of my head um but our measurements like the ones that i showed were measured in millimeters okay so your our weather stations convert are basically melt the snow down to get it into precipitation or right or so rain. we don't have I don't have any idea of the actual snow depth okay. at our stations. Okay. Yeah, it's the water okay. equivalent that we measure. Great. Okay. Uh, another question is um, uh, the system that we have uh, for de uh, determining, I guess, uh, wind speed. I guess when spraying, uh, risky conditions uh, like conversions and others. Is that part of the system? Is that information available? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So, um, the I guess all of determine the what spring is risky. I guess is uh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Uh, as uh, more as to help determine when spring is risky because because conditions like wind or inversion um, is that something that is available through our our uh, our weather stations oh yes yeah we do provide uh live wind speed and wind direction data they're measured at 10 meters at the top of our tower and again during the growing season and i think most of our stations even now are reporting every 15 minutes so if you go to that live uh current weather viewer and either select wind speed and you can see the wind speeds for all of the stations in the network or if you're closer to a given station, you can select that station and see the average wind speed and the wind gusts for the last 15 minutes. Okay, and probably wouldn't be able to get information regarding inversions and stuff like that then? Um, not for a station by station basis at this time. Okay, and... Uh... One last question is, uh, uh, who's best or who do you contact if the weather station in your area is down or not updating? Um, it's best to contact myself. Um, so my job is to kind of uh, monitor the whole network and uh, manage any issues and that sometimes depending on weather and that we can't necessarily get out to the site right away. Like I mean, we might not be able to drive up to Swan River today, um, but we do flag them and we do monitor our stations very closely as well. It's just sometimes um, we can't necessarily fix it depending on what the issue is right away. But especially during the growing season, we understand how important it is for those stations to be running. And it's our goal to, to have all the stations running properly as frequently as possible. Okay, so your contact information would be somewhere or, or the, would there be that contact information on our website as well, like when you go to the stations page? Um, yeah, or you can also contact the general 
uh, agriculture line um, okay. that's on the website and they send the requests right to me anyways and then I usually uh, communicate back to the person directly okay I'll be giving that number up here right away again so good okay. good I think uh, right now that's uh, all the questions we have for you uh, if you're able if you could hang on for a little bit uh, we're gonna go to our panel and uh, if some other questions come up that would we could probably get them answered today yeah great thanks very much great thanks for coming on Allison Lori, if uh, you could pass the screen back to me. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, last year we started uh, our crop scouting panel and uh, we uh, had fairly good success with it. And uh, so we decided to go with it again this year. So uh, I'm going to just go quickly through the, uh, the panel and introduce uh, who they are and, and what, uh, what some of their, uh, their uh, uh, specialties are and uh, so Ann Kirk uh, she's our uh, cereal specialist our cereal crop specialist uh, Dane Fraze he's our oilseed specialist uh, Dave Kaminsky uh, our uh, our pathologist uh, field crop pathologist uh, Dennis Lang uh, he'll be our pulse uh, and special our pulse crops guy uh, John Gavlowski, uh, our entomologist, uh, John Hurd, our crop nutrition and soils guy, uh, Marla Rickman, uh, again, another landscape and soils person, soil health, and Kim Brown, who's going to be new to the uh, panel this year. Uh, she's our new uh, weeds, uh, weeds person, so uh, glad to have her aboard as uh, helping us out with, uh, with any issues we may see with uh, weed problems. So uh, with that, I'm going to start the first one off, uh, I guess because the season got going really early this year and a lot of guys were starting to get uh, hot and anxious while getting out into the field, we were starting to get uh, quite a few questions coming in regarding, uh, especially regarding seeding peas uh, and how early is too early and how cold is too cold. So uh, we always uh, talk about peas being a crop that you can get in early. So I thought it'd be a good question for uh, Dennis Lang to uh, to uh, come on and and uh, and talk to that one, answer that question for us. Dennis, are you there? Yeah, we were having some audio challenges with Dennis. Um, do you want to try? We're still not hearing you, Dennis. Do you want to try the calling in option, and maybe we could come back to Dennis? Okay, that sounds good. I'll just jump to the next question here. Um, the other question, and uh, we talked about this in the weather, is the dry conditions and getting uh, producers uh, asking questions about the dry conditions. And then uh, on top of that, some of the fertilizer prices started to uh, climb uh, substantially over the last while. So uh, kind of some fertilizer strategies I can use to limit my dollar losses in case it stays dry. And I think... Uh, Talk to John, heard about that one, and he had a few ideas that he could maybe run by us. So, John, are you there? Yeah, I'm. I'm here. Uh, I presume I'm coming through loud and clear. So you bet. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you know, moisture conditions affect uh, a lot, if not most, of fertilization practices. And uh, right now, I think the uh, the one practice that uh, most people are going to use, uh, they're not going to do a lot of tillage. To incorporate uh, broadcast or pre-plant banded fertilizer, uh, people have spoke to uh, the first implement over the ground will be the seeder, and so if that's the case, that that limits uh, you know pre-plant banding, and uh, because you know for every tillage pass we do, we're going to lose moisture. Uh, but also when we pre-plant band nitrogen like ammonia, uh, we unless we put those bands very deep. Uh, we can cause stand thinning over those bands. So, uh, you know, that's the practice we saw last year causing some issues. So uh, I, I expect people will curtail their pre-plant banding. And so they'll be applying, you know, nitrogen at seeding and also employing uh, some risk management 
they may choose to uh, uh, be conservative with their yield potentials uh, based on the dryness. And if so, they could apply a portion of the nitrogen. Now we're at seeding. And then uh, we've had some uh, great research done recently on wheat showing that we actually achieved equal to higher yield and protein uh, when we came back at the STEM elongation stage with uh, uh, the remaining 30 to 60 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, that worked really good because we had rain shortly after. But it does show that, you know, we've got some in-season potential. If conditions, again, this is up to the grower agronomist to pass judgment, not, not me sitting in my basement. But if they think that they want to reduce the rates that are going on early and then come back later based on their assessment of a higher yield potential, you know, we've got some research to support that. But but everything's dependent on getting rain after you put on surface nitrogen. That that has not changed. And and I don't I don't want to take up all your time here, uh, Lionel. But you know, if we are using uh, surface nitrogen, uh, you know, we know how to protect that or reduce losses. We know that if volatilization is a risk, we use urease inhibitors. Uh, you know, we can reduce volatilization losses a lot by simply dribble banding our, our 28%. Uh, that, that sometimes is good as using a, state, uh, a urease inhibitor, but urease inhibitors do provide us uh, some, some uh, added protection. And, uh, but there's really no protection against stuff stranded at the surface there. And I saw Allison showed that map that uh, in Elm Creek, we went, 26 days without measurable precipitation last year. Well, I thought those 26 days were happening in May. And, you know, we had nitrogen that was spread on winter wheat and, and fall rye that I'm sure never worked its way into the root zone for a long time. And, you know, that's, that's just the risks you take with uh, surface applied nitrogen. So you mentioned oh, stem. Let me talk about seed place fertilizer. Like, uh, uh, why don't you kick this can to someone else, and then I'll come back and with more bad news later about seed place fertilizer. Okay, just one question before we leave this. You mentioned stem elongation. Uh, is there a window there um, where it's too late already, or, or I don't think it would be a problem to be maybe a bit on the early side, but. Uh, you know, is there a window where the, the fertilization or adding the fertilizer is past the point? Uh, well, that's a good question because the, the same project that uh, Don Flayton and Amy Marge were in, they went up until flag leaf emergence. So that's not full flag leaf, but that's when, you know, what, what the old timers call the shot blade. When the shot blade starts to peek out of the, uh, 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 of the elongated stem, they did a, an application then, uh, not quite as uh, high yield potential, uh, but again, good protein in wheat. Uh, so we could do that. Uh, I just wrote an article for posting based on some work Guy Lafon did, and he found that as long as it went on by stem elongation, uh, it was uh, good to go for full yield potential, uh, providing you've got some base nitrogen on early. Um, and with canola, uh, he was able to go up to, you know, just uh, you wanna have it on before you're in the full rosette stage because that canola plant is chugging a lot of nitrogen out of the ground as it goes from that uh, full rosette uh, 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 bolting stage. Um, so you'd probably wanna target it uh, before your canola bolts. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, if we uh, uh, got a bit of time towards the end here, we'll go back to that seed place question as well. Uh, cool. Next question is going to go to John Gavlossi. Uh, I had a producer in asking if uh, dry soil conditions would have any effect on wireworms and cutworms. And then a crop consultant was, uh, we were talking, and he was talking about soil temperatures and his have does the temperature have, have uh, with longevity of the seed treatments and, and instant control? So uh, I guess uh, 
two different questions there, one more about the dry conditions and then one about the cold conditions if we were seeding early here. Okay, yeah, uh, you can hear me okay, Lionel? You bet, John. Okay, yeah, so uh, regarding the wireworms and cutworms, uh, a little bit of moisture probably won't affect them much. A lot of moisture actually is detrimental to cutworms, if anything. Uh, it keeps them higher in the soil profile. They don't go down quite as deep when they're um, uh, spending their day in the soil. So it keeps them closer to the soil profile, makes them a bit more susceptible to predators and parasites. It also can cause uh, pathogens if the soil is too moist. So uh, generally drier soils would be more favorable for cutworms, too much moisture can be detrimental. And with wireworms, what the moisture does is it, it affects um, how long they stay high in the soil profile as well. So with wireworms, once the soil starts heating up and drying out, they move deeper into the soil and they actually become less of an issue. Um, if the soil is um, moist, they will stay higher in the canopy a bit longer. Uh, so yeah, there's different ways it, it can affect their behavior. Um, and your second question here, uh, seed treatments. I'm going to assume with the seed treatments, we're probably focusing more on flea beetles. So uh, there, there, there has been some work, Bob Elliott in Saskatoon did work testing the seed treatments at uh, different temperatures and uh, moistures. And he, his conclusions were that the seed treatments were more, I'm talking the neonic seed treatments for flea beetles, they were more effective in dry soils than wet soils, and they were more effective at 20 and 30 degrees than they were at 10 degrees. So wet and cool reduced their effectiveness, um, hotter and drier increased it. The trade-off here is once those seed treatments wear out, Hot and dry is really what flea beetles like to feed quite aggressively. So uh, even though those hot, dry conditions might, I guess, improve the, um, the effectiveness of the seed treatment, once those seed treatments wear off, those same conditions would increase the feeding rate of the flea beetles. So uh, yeah, ideally, uh, you probably, <laughs> you, you you want to get that good control, but then you, you want the conditions so that the flea beetles aren't going to be um, doing a lot of feeding. But what I try to stress to canola growers really is if you can get, if there's any way you can get your canola from seeding date to the three to four leaf stage within three weeks, that will reduce your risk. If not, then you, you run that risk of needing to do foliar sprays. So hopefully I address the questions, Lionel. Yeah, I think um, the one regarding the cutworms, I think producers were, uh, the producer was thinking or wondering if the, uh, he should be looking at uh, an insecticide for cutworm or should he be maybe saving some money and, and not, not going that road. And that's why I think that question came about. Yeah, now the, the, the other part to that too that I didn't address is, um, the way the, the the lack of moisture affects the plant. If the plants are struggling to get going, they are more susceptible to both wireworms and cutworms longer. So that's the other part to the puzzle that a grower has to factor in. If it's going to take a long time to get through the seedling stages, the plants just sit there um, more vulnerable to the wireworms and cutworms. So that's the other thing to consider. But it's that requires long-term uh, forecasting, though it's always hard to know what it's going to be like a couple of weeks down the road. You bet, yeah. We didn't uh, think we were going to get a, this uh, snowfall event, and it happened, so you never know. We could get, we could be talking it being too wet in the next uh, next couple of weeks. You never know. Great. Thanks, John. I think uh, maybe what we'll do is we're going to try... Dennis Lang again about the seeding of peas and see if we can get through with him. Okay, Dennis, if you want to try unmuting yourself again, it shows you as self-muted. There we go, give it a go, see if it's working. 
cannot hear you. So I guess we'll try something else, Dennis. <laughs> okay. Um, I just got a message from Allison. She said she checked the snow and water equivalent measurement. It is usually one centimeter of snow is equal to approximately one millimeter of water. So uh, uh, if you've got uh, four centimeters of snow or four or five centimeters of snow, you're looking at four to five millimeters of, uh, of moisture. So uh, thanks, Allison, for uh, getting that information to us. Uh, okay, so if we can't get uh, Dennis, uh, I'm going to go back to John Hurd and I'm going to ask him about the seed placement uh, for fertilizer. So if you could uh, maybe address that question for us, uh, John. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, because that, that is one of the concerns I, I've been, been hearing from agronomists uh, uh, right up to last fall. So what I'm hoping is that farmers have uh, met with their crop advisors or agronomists and, and maybe made a bit of a plan B. If, if there are people that have tended to put uh, more nitrogen in their seed row or uh, sulfur, uh, ammonium sulfate in their seed row, uh, those are the products that we're greatest concerned about under dry conditions, we end up with a greater salt effect and a greater ammonia effect, uh, reducing uh, stand, uh, crop emergence. Or, or germination and emergence, uh, particularly in uh, small seeded, th you know, crops like canola. So, the general thumb rule is for canola, we really need uh, seed placed or close to seed phosphorus. So we like to reserve that seed placed area for phosphorus. That's the greatest response. And then uh, because we have alternatives to putting on nitrogen and uh, sulfur away from the seed. Uh, and so, uh, uh, again, re re reserve uh, that seed row for phosphorus. There are limits to the amount of phosphorus that we can put on. Um, and so, so they may want to curtail those rates to starter rates and put the rest in, I don't know, a side band or, or, or mid row band or make it up at a later date when phosphorus prices are reasonable again. Uh, depends on the soil tests. I, I hope farmers have go back into their records and, and put your higher rates of phosphorus on those fields that warrant it. And they may be able to uh, back off to some starter rates on their higher testing fields. I can't call that shot. That's that's for intelligent farmers that have soil tests. They're, they're the ones that can make those uh, uh, decisions. Um, but yeah, we, when the risk is like this, when that tends to be dry, uh, we would uh, tend to want to reduce the amount of fertilizer with the seed. There's some products that have some safening activity, uh, like uh, ESN, we can sometimes look at applying up to three times as much nitrogen as if we were using urea. But, uh, you know, that's contingent also on the ESN uh, being fairly intact. And if it's been augered a lot, uh, guys want, might want to be shy if they think they've injured the coatings. Other than that, uh, I'm just going to advise people to be conservative and do as a couple shrewd growers did last year. Uh, leave a stamp in your field. And what I call that, that stamp is where you shut off the seed place fertilizer for 50 to 100 feet and then turn it back on again. And then you simply use that area uh, uh, as a measure of how much injury are we causing. Uh, the guys that did that last year learned something important for 2021. So may as well use 2021 to get smarter for 2022 or 2023. And uh, do that, it'll give you an assessment for your soil, your rates, your equipment, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know prepare you for uh, future decisions. That's all hey. I'll say about that line. I'm not going to show any charts or anything. Guy, guys can they can go on the websites and look at the charts and look at their own configurations. Um, okay, no, that's good, John. Um, uh, we're gonna give the Dennis Lang one, one more try here. So uh, I see that uh, he might be on on his phone. So uh, Dennis, are you there? I can hear you, Lionel, can you hear me? You bet, glad to have you aboard. Right. There you go, finally. 
I'm not sure what was happening. I can hear you fine uh, on my computer and, and just for whatever reason, it was not connecting. But anyways, so how early is it to feed peas? Well, I was getting calls the first week of, uh, uh, first week of April already asking if guys should be seeding. Um, my first thought is, well, before I even get to soil temperature, as I look at the long term, the, the forecast for the next week, and of course we're seeing snow for this week, and we did see snow. So ideally five degrees is what you kind of like to see, um, kind of an average of the morning and uh, late evening uh, uh, temperatures. But now with the snow that we're uh, seeing right now and, and the cooler weather, and, and for the rest of this week, we're looking at that kind of weather. Um, I would expect growers to get back into the field seeding towards the mid to latter part of next week. Uh, temperatures are going to start to warm up a little bit. And um, even though peas can tolerate those colder temperatures, you still want to put them into good soil conditions. And, you know, there's also that calendar date when you're looking at the first week of, uh, uh, of April. It's a bit early. There's lots that can happen in April. So as we can see now with the snowfall. So Really uh, getting your peas in uh, uh, mid to late next week is going to give us lots of time. It's still going to miss that heat in July yet, and you should be, you should be fine. But really watch the forecast because uh, if we start uh, getting cool again, you may want to hold off a little bit uh, and just put those peas into better soil conditions. Uh, one question that uh, I just uh, I, we got yesterday, actually. A guy's got his peas in, and uh, so... What should, does he have any worries right now? Uh, I know they wouldn't have germinated, but they're going to be sitting in cold soil for, you know, we're into day four now, I think it is. So, uh, you know, any concerns about that PC? I think your best bet right now is not to go and check it for, for about two and a half weeks and just leave it be. Um, nothing you can do about it at this point right now. Um, the cold soil temperatures, if, they're, if it's cold, it's probably not going to do a whole lot. What may end up happening is if it stays cool for too long, you may end up with a, a reduction of stand. That's nothing I'd worry about today, just because there's nothing you can really do about it. In a couple of weeks, uh, maybe go do an evaluation of the stand that is starting to pop up if there's anything and look at the seed and determine whether or not uh, uh, that seed is still viable at that point. But this, as of today, I wouldn't do anything. Okay, and uh, warm days uh, where the snow starts to melt here, and I'm thinking a lot of this moisture is going to go into the ground instead of run off this time, uh, and then nights where it goes to you know minus three or minus four. Um, any concerns there? I think in the same same boat right now. If you if you have peas in the ground, the best thing you can do is just kind of uh, wait it out. It's uh, that is one of the risks of going in the first week of April is that uh, the weather can turn. So um, at this point here, we just kind of wait and see. Peas are a lot tougher than, than, let's say, soybeans or dry beans in that respect. So you should be okay, but I wouldn't want to have a lot of acres in at that point. So Okay, good. Well, uh, thanks, Dennis, uh, for addressing that question. And I think uh, I've got a couple more slides here that I want to show today before we end it. Uh, uh, Wado, uh, Westman Ag Diversification Organization in Melita, is looking for a diversification technician. It's a one-year term, and uh, if you're interested, uh, there's the application there, or there's the, the job description there, and if you're interested or know somebody that might be interested in the summer job, uh, get the information to them. A uh, really good place to get some really good ag experience uh, for, for students especially. So. There's that. Um, field crop production guides are out uh, and available. Uh, a little bit different this year. Uh, they're available at uh, all the uh, some of the MASC offices. Uh, I listed the offices there. Um, or uh, actually, one of the best things to do is to give the one uh, the Manitoba Ag uh, uh, 1844 number a call, and they will. Uh, get you in touch with one of the offices uh, or give you the numbers for one of those offices so you can make your call and and uh, make an appointment or get your book through them that way. So a little bit different this year, but uh, the books are available and they are around. Um, another little bit of a change. Um, there, uh, the uh, 
a farm production extension specialist. Our ag adaptation specialists now uh, uh, have changed a little bit. Uh, we're down one member. Uh, Les Mitchell is now doing more of the maps that you've seen with that uh, Allison had was using. Uh, Les is helping them put those maps together. Uh, but uh, and also there's a few changes in locations of some of the staff. So uh, myself, I'm in Minnedosa, and there's my contact information. Uh, Terry Buss in Beauxjeux, uh Earl Bergen, Bargen in Steinbach, Nicole Fawson in Swan River, Amir Farouk in Brandon, uh, Marnie McCracken in the Paw, and Rajon Picard in Morden. So. Um, uh, another thing I would say is if you're looking for your uh, weed guides or you're looking for any information to give uh, these guys a call and uh, they can help you with uh, finding uh, finding the information you need. Again, uh, there is, uh, if you're looking for the credits for your crop advisor, they're available through these uh, webinars and uh, you can send, uh, continue to send your information to uh, Lori Forbes and uh, also uh, if you want to join us uh, next week uh, April uh, um, April 21st sorry I forgot to put Ingrid on the slide I am uh, apologize for that uh, I was in a uh, uh, rush putting this together and I miss uh, uh, Ingrid uh, she's in Gimli and uh, so uh, Sorry about that, and I will update that one for, for next week. Um, and uh, again, uh, join us next week, uh, April the 21st. Uh, and there's our Manitoba Ag uh, uh, email address and our number again if you have questions. So uh, thanks for joining us today, and uh, we'll see you again next week.